Good morning, Vine Church. Thanks for joining us uh, this Sunday morning. I'm glad that you are here. Uh, some of you have already received your Alyssa uh, t-shirt. Again, we're praying for Alyssa, a uh, little little eight-year-old in our church who is desperately needs the Lord to heal her and um, such great progress so far. And so I wanted to start off with a word of prayer for Alyssa. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, would you please heal this little girl? We love her so much, but we know, Father, you love her more. And Father, we ask, Lord, that you would completely remove this tumor, that, Lord, you would do great things in her. Uh, we pray, Lord, you'd heal her. Thank you for the progress that has taken place, Lord, uh, especially this past few days. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness and, and wonderful blessings. Continue, Lord, to be with mom and dad and, the, and the, her siblings, Lord. Uh, we thank you, Father, that you love us. And we, are, we don't deserve your love and grace and mercy and kindness and forgiveness. And we so are so grateful for it. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So as you can tell, uh, this is not right wood. Um, this is my garage, and I had a heck of a time this week. I set up almost, I think, four or five times, and either a swarm of flies or gusts of wind, and here I am having to, I'm just using the garage. So I'm hoping that... Um, I can use this scene because behind me is my filthy workbench. And you probably have one that looks like this too. All kinds of different tools. Um, I want to use this backdrop because a lot of times in the Christian life, we feel like once we get saved that our lives are now complete. And it is true that in Christ we are complete. But we also are complete and we are also his complete project and that he is working in us and through us uh, to make us more and more like Jesus. That workbench has seen some times when things have gotten fixed. It's also seen some times when things didn't get fixed. Uh, but all of us are in the Lord's workbench for the rest of our lives. None of us arrive, not until we see the Lord Jesus face to face. And Asaph, I believe, was sitting on the Lord's workbench. And so if you have your Bibles, let's go to Psalm 77. Psalm 77. And Asaph wrote this um, for Jeduthun, uh, who is the choir director. And obviously we don't know how the song was sung or what kind of music was behind when these words were spoken in the Hebrew. But we do have these words. These are divided into 20 verses, and there are several interludes. There are several times to pause, which is important because you want to have a you want to have a Bible that will tell you, hey, this is it's this is an interlude. It's not there accidentally. It's there because by the power of the Holy Spirit, we're to take a breather, look back over what was already written, look back over how we feel with those verses, and pause. Let it. Let it sink in and then move forward and see how the psalm progresses. And so let's look at Psalm 77. It's a psalm written by Asaph. In verse 1 through 3 he says, I cry out to God. Yes, I shout. Oh, that God would listen to me! Exclamation point. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long I prayed with hands lifted toward heaven. But my soul was not comforted. I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. Interlude. These first three verses sound like Asaph is struggling in his time of waiting for God to answer his prayer. What is it that you have been praying for, that you've been praying for, for two weeks and it hasn't been answered what have you been praying for you still haven't got an answer and it's been two weeks think of that now what have you been praying for that hasn't been answered in two months 
been waiting for two months since March. What have you been praying for that hasn't been answered for two years? You're still praying for it. No change. Two years. And those of you that are older, what have you been praying for for 12 years that hasn't been answered yet? 20 years. It may be you know of something that you've been praying for and then God knows you've been praying for this for 40 years, maybe even more. I know that we have people in our church that their story was that someone was praying for them for many, many years to get saved and, and their faithful praying was over and over and over for years and years and then the Lord got a hold of their heart and, and they got saved. You might be praying for someone to get saved and it's been a long, long time. Well, Asaph, he's cried out to God. He's, he says, yes, I shout. And he cries out, oh, that God would listen to me. And it's as if he's going, I don't think God's listening to me. This isn't him being disrespectful. God is bigger than us being disrespectful. We, we can be disrespectful with the wrong attitude. We can also be honest and when we are frustrated, bring it to him, take it to him. And he says, oh, that God would listen to me. When I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. All night long, I prayed with hands lifted toward heaven. But look what it says, but my soul was not comforted. This whole idea that we get saved and everything turns out great and the Christian life is victorious because we get everything that we ask for and life is always just a wonderful thing and, and we show up to church with this goofy smile on our face and anytime we see people at church, well, we used to go to church, but now we watch it on video, but when we used to meet together at church, we would have this goofy smile and yeah, everything's great. Everything's always great. Um, and it's such a lie. It's not true at all. This is true. This is what's real. Here's a man who loves God, and he's in deep despair. And he's crying out to God. He's shouting to God. He's in deep trouble, and his soul's not being comforted. That's real. If you're going, hey, man, that's where I'm at today, then circle Psalm 77, get your pen out, and start circling some key words. I've underlined several things. Deep trouble. Underline that again right here. Deep trouble. Um, my soul was not comforted. And then in verse 3, I think of God and I moan. Oh my goodness. Overwhelmed with longing for his help. Overwhelmed. The Christian life is a whole lot more of being up in the Lord's vice and being held in place and wondering when's he going to come back in the garage and hang out and do his work on me the longer that we know the lord when we first get to know the lord we first come to him we, we're called babes and infants and when an infant cries most of the time you you, you give them milk give them mother's milk and the crying goes away they cry because they're hungry but that doesn't last forever that the child grows up and is weaned and there comes a time when you have to be patient and you have to wait. It's not that people are being, that anyone is being uh, hurting you, but you have to wait. Um, you're at a school and, and you, hey, I'm ready to eat lunch. No, you can't eat lunch now. We're in the middle of a science project. What's, you know, I used to cry, and as soon as I cried, I would put, they'd put a bottle in my mouth. Well, you know, now you're in fifth grade, you know, and... You're going to just have to deal with being a little hungry until it's time to have lunch. Um, as we grow in our walk with the Lord and we're in with the Lord longer, his distance or his quiet in our life isn't a sign that he has left us. And I, I, I know so many people, oh, I used to be a believer, or, or you hear about these stories, I used to follow the Lord, but now, and what happens is, is that they've gotten trapped into thinking that God's going to treat them like a baby. He's not, he promises that he'll never leave us or forsake us. He's always with us. 
but he's doing a work in us while we wait. And I hate waiting. So obviously, God's always working in me with this whole waiting thing. Asaph's waiting on the Lord. He, he's shouting. He's in deep tr trouble. He, he's not comforted. He's overwhelmed. And then there's an interlude. So we have these three verses from Asaph. He's frustrated. It seems as if God's not listening. And then he goes into this next section, which is four through nine. You don't let me sleep. I am too distressed even to pray. I think of the good old days, long since ended. When my nights were filled with joyful songs, I search my soul and ponder the difference now. That's important. Asaph, he's thinking about the good old days when when the nights were full of joyful songs and he's like, obviously he's not in a joyful time of, at night. He's trying to pray. He's even too, too overwhelmed to pray at night. He's been lifting his hands to the Lord at night and it's just a long, dark night. Nothing's happening. He doesn't sense the presence of the Lord. And then it says in verse 6, I search my soul and ponder the difference now. Ponder the difference. I love that verse because I think what he's saying there is, I look inside me and find out, why isn't God answering my prayer like he used to answer my prayer? Well, it may be sometimes there's there might be sin in our life and... and we need to come to the Lord and repent of that and, and ask him for forgiveness. And that, that's a possibility. But he searches his soul. He's pondering, why the change, God? Why from when you used to answer me quickly to now? Why is it that I can't sense you? And then he asks these uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. He asks six questions before the next interlude. Here's the questions. First question. He says, has the Lord rejected me forever? Oh, when God isn't answering your prayers, don't you, aren't you just like, Lord, are you going to reject me forever? Second question. Will he never again be kind to me? You feel like, man, this is just, this is so awful. And this situation is so tough. And he used to be so kind to me. I used to have joyful songs at night. But now, Lord, are you ever going to be kind to me again? Third question, verse 8. Is his unfailing love gone forever? Fourth question. Have his promises permanently failed? Fifth question. Has God forgotten to be gracious? Last question. A great question, this last one. Has he slammed the door on his compassion wow has he slammed the door on his compassion and then we get the word interlude so i will take a sip of my coffee so let's pause and think about that the first section he's crying out to god overwhelmed and he's not comforted the second section he can't even sleep he's so distressed and then he finishes that section with six questions. Lord, have you, have you rejected me? Are you ever going to be kind to me again? Is your unfailing love gone? Are your promises permanently failed? Have you forgotten to be gracious to me, God? And then the last question. Has he slammed the door on his compassion? Wow. The idea that the Christian life is rosy and that we come to Christ and we immediately get this genie in a bottle who pops out and solves all of our problems is such baloney. And then this idea of the Christian life is all about prospering and everything's always going well. And if it's not going well, well, then you must be doing something wrong. I, I, can't, even, I can't even begin to tell you how frustrating that is because it is so far from the truth this guy's hurting and asaph i'm sorry you're hurting but i'm actually glad you're hurting because this helps us when we're hurting and 
we can relate to this. And I have a feeling many of you can relate to this. It's like, Lord, you've, you're just so quiet right now. And it's not that he's not there. He's there in the waiting. And you and I are growing during that time. And trust me, I don't like it. But I know that's what scripture tells us. And it's okay to be real with God. God, are you ever going to answer my prayer? That's a fair thing to ask God. And so Asaph asked these six questions. And then we have two more sections. And I want to read this next section, 10 through 15. And I said, this is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. He has these six questions of where's the Lord's compassion and kindness. And then he just goes, "Ah, this is my fate. That's it. That's it. God has rejected me and I am rejected forever. And that is his final say. And it's not that he's heard from the Lord, that the Lord said, yeah, I'm not going to give you my promises or compassion or kindness anymore. It's that he's gone down this trajectory of not hearing from the Lord and, and, and sensing such troubling times that he has now decided that since there is silence from God, that equals, God's silence equals that that's my fate. He, God doesn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. And that's not what God is saying. In fact, in this entire psalm, God doesn't say anything. But the Lord is at work. Because the Lord then uses Asaph's past. He uses Asaph's memory. Verse 11. But then I recall. So verse 10. This is my fate. The Most High has turned his hand against me. But then I recall. But then I recall. All you have done. O Lord. I remember your wonderful deeds of long ago. They are constantly in my thoughts. I cannot stop thinking about your mighty works. O oh God, your ways are holy. Is there any God as mighty as you? You are the God of great wonders. You demonstrate your awesome power among the nations. By your strong arm you redeemed your people the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. And then there's an interlude. So in this section, he's decided, that's it, this is my fate. The way I'm feeling right now about God and him not answering my prayers when I need him to must mean that his silence equals that he's done with me and that my sin can't be forgiven or his grace will never be given or he won't answer this need that I have. But then the Holy Spirit works inside his mind and prompts him to remember the blessings that God has already done. Wow. That's why it's important to journal, just to record each day. Lord, you know, this is how I'm feeling. This is what you're working on. This is how you answered prayers. These are the answers. These are the prayers I'm still waiting to hear you answer. But thank you, Lord, and and write these kinds of things down. We're basically in the Psalms reading people's journals. But we don't remember very well. So he recalls all that the Lord has done. And then he goes and thinks back of how the Lord has worked through the nation of Israel. And then let's look at this last section. It says when the red verse 16 when the red sea saw you O god its waters looked and trembled now that's a, that's pretty awesome because as this nation that was enslaved for 3 400 years in Egypt these israelites and moses shows up and says that god's going to bring them out of slavery and god is at work and and walking them out of Egypt and they get up to the red sea and there's no bridge there's no bridge. There's, uh, we used to live up in the Bay Area. There's no BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit. It goes underneath the bay, pops back up into Oakland or pops back up into San Francisco. When all of these people, these millions of people that are, are going to be saved from slavery, they get to the Red Sea. And in verse 16, Asa says, When the Red Sea saw you, O God, its waters looked and trembled. The waters were like, uh uh-oh, God, 
is looking at us. And then it says that the sea quaked to its very depths. Verse 17, the clouds poured down rain. The thunder rumbled in the sky. Your arrows of lightning flashed. Your thunder roared from the whirlwind. The lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and shook. And then here's verse 19. People of Israel, enslaved, set free, but not in the promised land, standing on the shore of the Red Sea. Moses is going, okay, we're stuck. He's got the armies of Egypt behind him, the people grumbling. How are we going to get out of here? And there's no bridge. Verse 19, Asaph reminds himself and us, your road, your road led through the sea. Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters. A pathway no one knew was there. How many times have I come up to the Red Sea in my life? Let's say the Red Sea is something blocking us from what answers our prayers. And I've thought, this is it. I'm just going to end up dying right here at the Red Sea. When in fact, the Lord isn't creating a bridge. He's not bringing a boat. But he's going to powerfully and miraculously move the obstacle. And Asaph says, your road led through the sea. In verse 20, he says, you led your people along that road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. And then the psalm ends. Did Asaph end the psalm with, and then God answered all my prayers? No. Did Asaph have more questions? No. But he got his answers. That the answer is, when we're waiting, God is still good. And he's still there. And he still loves us. And it may be that what we see is the Red Sea being the end that God's saying no actually I want to show you my incredible power as I can do the miracle I can do the miraculous and Asaph says when the Red Sea saw God he, the Red Sea just shook and quaked to its very depths and as you remember Moses and the Israelites walked across dry land across the Red Sea and then the Lord brought the water back down on top of their enemies. Wow. Wow. Father, we thank you that, Lord, sometimes you answer our prayers quickly. Sometimes it seems as if you take forever. So, Father, when we have thought that you don't like us, don't love us, you're not with us, that your compassion and unfailing love is gone, that we have just blown it too much, and your silence is because you have turned your back on us. Father, forgive us when we have thought that. Because, Lord, you are faithful and your promises are good. And you are at work, even though we can't see it. Father, when you brought the Israelites up to the Red Sea, only you could see the path that was covered with all that water. And, Father, I know, Lord, in our lives... There are answers and deliverances coming and promises being fulfilled. But Father, sometimes all we see is the, the water. We see the obstacle. And so Father, help us and guide us and direct us. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope you have a great week.